thank you all for being here and welcome Eric Alderman. Quite a place. If there were more churches like this, I'd be giving a different talk today. Uh, I mean, I mean it. That's part of the story is, uh, is how important such churches have been to the history of liberalism and, and how the church, church has changed um, in recent decades. Um, I also want to uh, publicly um, thank uh, Tim. Um, we got to know each other originally because uh, I guess I I'm a Jew, but I would say out of Christian charity, uh, Tim wrote me out of the blue and said, you know, I found a number of small errors in your book. And uh, <laughs> if there's a second edition of it, you might want to correct them. And he, um, <laughs> it was like six pages long. I'm, I'm not <laughs> kidding. And, and fortunately, um, he got it to me like within a few days of when the uh, paperback changes were due. So in perpetuity, it will reflect Tim's um, both diligence and charity uh, in, in improving it. I mean, I have a lot of excuses for how that, why this was the case. I had a co-author, my editor was moving, his assistant quit, you know. But um, my name is the name that's on the book, so I'm the one who's uh, responsible and also most grateful to Tim, uh, both for that largely, but also um, for this opportunity to be here today. Um, so, uh, my book is a history, this book, is a history of post-war American liberalism. Uh, and whenever I give a talk about liberalism, if it's, um, if it's not a liberal audience, they say, what is your problem? You know, I, I actually went on uh, many years ago, 1997. I was sent by the Nation magazine on the National Review cruise to Alaska with William F. Buckley and Milton Friedman and Robert Novak. And, um, you know, they charge extra money to, ha to see those people. They didn't, they should have charged for me because I was like a zoo animal on that cruise. I would <laughs> sit down to dinner and people go, how does anyone believe the things that you believe, you know? Aren't your parents ashamed of you? Um, but when I speak to more liberal audiences, the question, uh, with this book anyway, is always, what's the matter with Barack Obama? Why can't, he, why can't he move the country the way Franklin Roosevelt did? Why are we in the shape that we're in when we elected this guy who sounded so great when we elected him? Um, both times actually sounded pretty good the second time too. Um, so uh, I like to begin by talking about the way liberalism has transformed itself over time. And in the middle of that story is, is, the, is the, the liberalism. We go back to um, the founding of liberalism, then we stop briefly at Rooseveltian liberalism, and I take you up to the present, and uh, should have plenty of time for questions. Since the, book, the book's been out for a while, so I'm, I have this part down. You know, I can do it pretty quickly. In any case, um, liberalism originally uh, came into uh, into being in the, uh, around, a little bit, uh, around the um, mid uh, 18th century, uh, very late 17th century. And it really meant nothing more, but at the time, quite a lot, than an embrace of the Enlightenment. So before we had liberalism, we had kings, and we had the church, different church than this church, although there is some relation. Um, and there was no basis to oppose either one except for the, the uh, material interests of the people involved. So if a, if a, if a local gentry or, a, or, a ro or a ro someone in, in, uh, related to royalty or someone empowered by the church was uh, seemed to be a bad ruler, you could get people together to get rid of them somehow, often by force. But you couldn't really appeal to any arguments about any, any abstract notions, uh, because there were none. Um, so, I mean, there was the traditions of Greek democracy and Roman Republic, the Roman Republic, but those were considered failures at the time. They had, they had been tried and failed. 
they had become corrupted. So um, what the Enlightenment uh, argued is simply that people are capable of deciding things for themselves. Uh, if you allow people to um, think as they like, communicate as they like, uh, worship as they like, uh, they, can, they can come up with their own ways to organize themselves in society, and they have that right. And that, the, uh, and that there is a separate sphere for kings, if you have kings at all, you don't really need them, but certainly for the church. Um, it's, uh, the, liberalism was nothing more, but again, an awful lot at the time, than an embrace of, um, an endorsement of men's ability to reason and to compromise and therefore to govern himself. Um, and these were, the, these were the principles upon which this country was founded. Uh, we hold these truths to be self-evident. Um, they were the principles of the French Revolution. And, you know, they, they, uh, they sound great, and they, they can work pretty well. They work quite well in many respects for this country, less well for the French Revolution. Um, but they, um, they're certainly imperfect when it comes to applying them to everyday life. There's an awful lot of um, room for uh, misinterpretation, but also for uh, to take them too far, to think that, um, that individuals can decide anything and that there are no limits to the ability of people to order their own lives. Um, and of course, they can't really be, um, they couldn't really be perfectly applied because uh, even if you believe in them, there were all kinds of material interests that get in the way of living one's life according to these truths, most obviously. Slavery was a big one. Uh, it's very hard to, um, to square those two tendencies uh, at the beginning of this country, and they were never really squared, actually. I mean, the great liberal writers of, um, of the period, Thomas Jefferson being the most obvious, uh, were very anti-slavery in their writings, but um, certainly didn't live that life. Um, in any case, uh, liberalism was seen as um, primarily as a philosophy for individuals. In other words, the, uh, it, was in, it was seen in opposition to the arguments of the state or the community, or the, however you organize that. Um, and what it did is it empowered individuals to own themselves, to own their labor, to own their minds, to own the directions that they um, chose to pursue, through which they chose to pursue happiness. And in that sense, um, it is no different than conservatism today if you leave out it, conservatism as a philosophy. If you leave out the whole church part of conservatism, the religious right, and you look at people like Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher, um, they are classical liberals. They believe that the state has no business telling people what, what to think or how to behave or interfering in the marketplace and that everyone has entitled to their own labor, et cetera, um, and the fruits of, um, of whatever virtues they have. Now, the problem with, that, with classical liberalism, probably the, 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 the most important and influential exponent of classical liberalism for the past century is probably Milton Friedman. Um, the problem with that is that, again, it runs up against reality in ways that make the practice of the theory uh, impossible. So what happened in the United States is that uh, beginning in the uh, late, early, late 19th century, early 20th century, it became apparent that the freedoms that are exercised under liberal philosophy, enlightenment freedoms, were almost entirely theoretical. If you look at the condition of sweatshops, if you look at the condition of uh, most working people, uh, of the enormous influx of immigrants that had um, begun to come over in the mid-19th century, um, these people had a right to um, sell their labor, but because of the supply and demand of labor, 
at the time. It was, it was akin to saying they had a right to starve. Um, they had a right to work uh, 18 hours a day, even as children, under unsafe conditions. And, um, and all these other rights that they had were essentially meaningless if you're working 18 hours a day and you're just barely subsisting. You don't really have time to pursue uh, you know, philosophical doctrines uh, or, or any form of quote unquote happiness. So liberalism entered a second phase beginning with the progressive movement of the late 19th century and uh, eventually um, coming to fruition in the New Deal, uh, which really didn't really get going until Roosevelt's second term. It, there were a lot of legislation, there was a lot of legislation in Roosevelt's first term but it wasn't really New Deal legislation that we associated. Um, and that, and, and what the second phase of liberalism, New Deal liberalism argued, was that we haven't really changed our beliefs about what the point of liberalism is, but in order to make it meaningful, the people need to join together as a collective to oppose the forces that are between them and the realization of their hopes and dreams as Enlightenment figures. And there are a number of ways to do this. You can do it in a church group, I suppose. You can do it in a union. But the best way to do it is through a strong central government. Because only a strong central government can stand up to the trusts, to the power of the robber barons, to the people who are actually causing uh, the difficulties that, that got in the way of people living out the liberal dream. So New Deal liberalism was, again, it was about the pursuit of individual happiness, but it was about the protection of that pursuit through collective means. Uh, and those collective means had, had many expressions. There was a lot, there were, there were many, it's, it's a mistake to look at the New Deal and say it was only the government. It was an entire culture of collective expression, beginning with labor unions and, and various forms of culture that people joined together, people used to go out a lot more in those days and go to meetings and so forth, uh, that they don't do these days. But, um, but the, main, the main point of it was that, uh, that the common man required a strong government on his side to fight the forces of the wealthy and the powerful and the institutionalized. When I say institutionalized, I mean institutionalized power, not institutionalized because of um, emotional problems. <laughs> Um, so this was an in incredible success, uh, coming as it did in the, in, the, uh, in the thick of the Depression when these conservative forces had been discredited. Um, it, was a, it was an incredible success in political terms uh, once they adopted what Roosevelt called um, militant liberalism. Uh, Democrats won 12 out of 13 congressional elections in a row and four to five presidential elections in a row. Um, at the end of uh, Roosevelt's um, second term, beginning of his third term, uh, 80, 80 senators were Democrats and something like 300 representatives. Um, so uh, with the exception of the Supreme Court, they could pass any legislation they wanted to, as long as the Supreme Court signed on to it. And of course, he had some trouble with the Supreme Court, but that worked itself up. Of course, World War II came, and he didn't really use that power to pass New Deal legislation, but that's a detail. Um, my point is the degree to which it was successful. But it was a devil's bargain, because uh, the South, which was firmly ensconced in the Democratic Party, it wasn't that populist. They didn't have that many senators or representatives. You could beat them in a vote. But because uh, Southerners are naturally deferential, once you get a Southern Senate seat or a congressional seat, you can pretty much keep it forever. And so they had enormous seniority, and Congress worked on the seniority system. So all of the chairs of all the important committees were conservative Southerners. And you couldn't get any progressive legislation out of those southern senators unless you were certain it didn't include blacks. So all of the New Deal legislation is written specifically, it doesn't say no blacks allowed, but it's written in, in specifically to allow 
um, agricultural exceptions, um, any kind of exception that was necessary they would get to ensure that no blacks were empowered in the South. Um, in the North, it was problematic as well, but it was very clear in the South. So it was a, um, it was, it was a, it was a great program. It created the middle class in this country. It, uh, it did a lot of wonderful things and empowered people, um, you know, built a national highway system and so forth. Uh, but it excluded blacks and other minorities. Um, and, uh, and it just, it didn't really have anything to say to them. It just said, uh, you know, it, occasionally crumbs were offered, but, e but, it, but even crumbs were threatening to the Southerners. So those were, and it also, um, it weakened, it, ne it prevented the creation of a nationwide labor movement because naturally the Southerners were worried about their workers who were black in many respects. So, um, so this period lasted until the late 1950s, early 1960s. And I have to say, um, you know, I researched this book for a long time. One of the most disappointing things to me about the history of liberalism was how little was said about this until the civil rights movement forced liberals to deal with it. In other words, the great liberals who I, ex who I had admired going in and expected to learn more about and continue to admire, they, they were at best silent about this. People like John Kenneth Galbraith and Arthur Schlesinger had nothing to say. Adlai Stevenson was terrible on these issues. He was, he was a southerner and he, he opposed most of the, um, the very small uh, actions. Things like Lyndon Johnson's, you know, very limited efforts um, to uh, <coughs> to legislate on behalf of civil rights. Well, anyway, the, um, I don't know if you want to call the civil rights movement a liberal movement. I can, I can go either way on that argument. It's, it's obviously a church-based movement. Um, and it was a challenge to liberalism. It, it used liberal language to challenge liberalism. But also, of course, uh, it grew out of the church more than anything, I would say. Um, when, uh, you know, the, the, the phrase that always stuck with me is, is King's phrase that justice delayed is justice denied. So the liberals kept saying, be patient, be patient, be patient. And the, um, the civil rights marchers kept going in and getting their heads beaten in and um, forcing the government to just protect their life and liberty. And uh, there was also a Cold War element to this that it was very embarrassing for the Kennedy administration to be seen to, ha to, in other words, they were giving great propaganda to the Russians by all this flowery rhetoric and look what's happening over here. Um, so the Kennedy administration eventually, after much hemming and hawing, John and Robert Kennedy had never really given any thought to civil rights before the election. You know, the blacks were considered to be just another um, interest group that you made some deal with. like you know, like labor, although not nearly as powerful. Um, so Kennedy eventually threw in with the civil rights movement. And uh, of course, at, he, he wasn't all that successful in getting anything passed, but after he died and uh, Johnson came in, uh, civil rights uh, became a fundamental aspect of liberalism. And you entered a third phase of liberalism, which is, in <coughs> which politically, is the most problematic phase. And that is the phase that says that any form of unfairness in the land is the job of the federal government to fix. So you begin with, I mean, if you, give, if you begin with pictures of dogs and water cannons attacking, you know, peaceful marchers and children, that seems like a pretty easy one, you know. Who, who, who could be against that? But all these other people, who to one degree or another felt themselves discriminated against by the way American life was set up, said, well, why them and not me? And, um, and, and, and this had a lot to do with the internal arrangements of people's lives, things like housing patterns and, you know, family matters, what had always been considered family matters and 
and relationships between husbands and wives and so forth. So the 60s liberalism, in which everyone asserted their right to, uh, again, fulfill the original intent of um, enlightenment liberalism, but demanded that the government um, uh, not only eliminate all barriers to that, but in addition to that, um, make up for past injustices, which is a very complicated concept, you know, because everyone feels themselves to be some victim of some injustice in some way. I mean, poor Barack Obama had Bob Woodward picking on him this week, you know. It was foolish. Wood Woodward wasn't telling the truth. It was an injustice. But I don't feel sorry for Barack Obama. He's, he's going to be fine. Um, you know, my daughter, she's 14. You wouldn't believe the injustices that she lives with every day from her parents. It's horrible. Yesterday, there was a homework assignment that looked to me like it wasn't done, and she said it was done, and she had already left the house. And I made her come back, all the way back, and explain it to me, and then go back. It cost her an hour and 10 minutes that she could have spent. It's terrible. So my point is, is that everyone feels themselves to be the victim of injustice in one way or another, and an awful lot of people genuinely are, but that once you start competing for the resources of the government to fix that injustice and to make up for previous injustices, you have a recipe for endless internal warfare between what had been the traditional liberal constituencies. And that's what happened after the 1960s. I mean, you had a lot of other problems. You had Vietnam, you know. You had the exhaustion, you had the exhaustion of the civil rights movement. You had the new left, which imploded in a variety of ways, and we can talk about that. My book is pretty, surprisingly to me, also unsympathetic to the new left. Um, and, and, and perhaps most importantly, the, 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 the basis, the people who were putting together 60s liberalism, the, the professionals, their theory was, um, we can fix all this with an ever-expanding pie. We just need to, you know, give out, we just need more pie to give people, and, and as long as things are getting better, uh, they'll, they'll be satiated. But of course, at the same time all this was happening, the American economy began to contract. This was in part a product of the Cold War, and the fact that we had built up all these other economies that were now more efficient than ours, in part uh, of the legacy costs of, that the unions had um, gotten, and in part of the laziness and bad management on the part of uh, big business. Um, and also overextension in Vietnam and elsewhere with regard to the military budget. But the fact is, is that the world changed and that the assumption, the fundamental foundation of this expanding pie that had been the basis of satisfying these complaints begin shrinking instead of uh, expanding. And so the various interest groups were fighting each other over, over resources that were uh, getting smaller and smaller, and that made the fights uglier and uglier. And if you look at the history of liberalism in the 70s, um, and for much of the 80s, it, liberals actually hate one another more than they hate the conservatives. So there's, it's uh, the tyranny of small differences, but the, the fights are most intense um, between various liberal constituencies. And of course, um, conservatives who had felt themselves in 1964 to be sort of read out of American life. Barry Goldwater was defeated so badly that uh, the smart pundits were saying the Republican Party needed to become more liberal than the Democratic Party if it wanted to stay in existence. They had gone back um, sort of to their roots and invested an enormous amount of money in creating institutions, not really to challenge the philosophy of liberalism, but to challenge the empirical basis of knowledge that undergirded it. So they created all these, ins all these think tanks, and now you see their talk radio and television stations that deny what the rest of us and the rest of the world understand to be reality. Um, it sounds funny, but it happens every day. Um, they have theories, and it's very hard to disprove a theory, you know. And so um, the mere act of reporting a problem, which would be challenging a power, uh, became ideologically tainted. 
And because liberals were so ineffective um, politically and symbolically, attacking symbols of patriotism, attacking religion, um, not appearing to stand up for uh, American values, not really even standing up for anything, and also eschewing a fight generally. The joke is um, liberals show up uh, for a gunfight with a library book. Um, the conservatives were able to uh, define liberalism in such a way that it had almost entirely negative connotations in people's minds. Um, elitism is the most obvious one. You always hear that. Um, but also pusillanimous and uh, looking down on people and unwilling to stand up for the country, anti-religion, anti-patriotic, um, anti-Semitic in uh, many, many cases, according to these arguments. And so, um, and so liberalism, by the time of George Bush's election in 2000, uh, after um, Ronald Reagan had sort of successfully supplanted Franklin Roosevelt as the father figure of, the modern father figure of the country. Uh, it was in terrible, terrible shape. And if George Bush hadn't been George Bush, if he had been some halfway reasonable person, <laughs> um, the Republicans could have continued to, sort of the way if, if uh, was it George III, if he had not been insane, we would still be English. If this George had not been crazy in the ways that he was crazy, or listened to Dick Cheney in the ways that he did, um, th they would have remained in power for an awfully long time because uh, there was a kind of um, modus operandi between the religious right and big business Republicans that they were pretty good at compromising. They had, you know, sort of power brokers who would knock their heads together at the right moment in a way liberals we're really bad at. Liberals like to argue, um, liberals like to claim moral victories, which is another word for defeat, <laughs> and, and, they, and they like to blame each other. And conservatives like to divide up the spoils. And, and uh, they were very good at that for a while. Um, I have a longer story about that, but I want to be able to um, give us time for a conversation. But if you ask me the story, I'll tell you. It's a pretty good story. All right, it's a good story. So here, here's the story. So remember Ralph Reed? Yeah. And you, of course, you all remember Newt Gingrich. So, because he hasn't really, actually, Ralph hasn't really gone away either. Anyway, so back when Ralph Reed was really important, and Newt Gingrich was the minority leader of the House, um, Newt called him in for a meeting and said, uh, so look, Ralph, I have these, um, what was that thing he had called? That, that document? Contract with America. Yeah, thanks. He says, I have this contract with America. It's got 10 points. What I need from you is um, $6 million because I want to I publish this contract with America in every issue of TV Guide and Reader's Digest and whatever for a month. And, um, and that way we'll win the House and I'll be the speaker. So Ralph looked at the contract with America, and it didn't have anything about uh, abortion. It didn't have anything telling gays they were going to hell, you know. It didn't have anything that was part of the Christian coalition's agenda. So he said, Newt, how can you ask me to give you my members uh, money, six million of it, when you don't address any of our issues in your um, contract. And, Ralph, and Newt said, wouldn't you rather be asking that question of the Speaker of the House? <laughs> and, uh, and so he gave him the money. And he got a lot of what he wanted once Gingrich became Speaker of the House. And I submit that uh, liberals wouldn't have even been able to agree on an order for those questions, much less uh, leaving out their issue and waiting to um, talk to the Speaker of the House about them. Uh, in any case, uh, Bush, for better and for worse, was so terrible that he discredited conservatism. But that's not the same thing as empowering liberalism. So Obama um, and Hillary Clinton both ran 
very centrist campaigns. The, the media tend to call them liberals because the media call anyone who's not a conservative a liberal. But um, if you look at their stance on the issues, they never call themselves liberals, by the way. No Democratic presidential candidate has called himself a liberal really since George McGovern. Um, and, uh, and, you know, on some positions they're center left and on some positions they're center right. But as, long, as, we, under, as we historically understand liberalism to be on the side of the little guy against the big guy, uh, there's not that much of that. Um, on the one hand, on the other hand, culturally speaking, the country has become much more liberal than I think most of us would have imagined, uh, and much more quickly. Um, you know, to be called a, a name that implied you uh, were not a heterosexual when I was a young man was one of the worst things you could be called. In fact, we were warned against like walking down streets where you might see them, and now, uh, gay marriage, uh, you know, my daughter, she's 14, and well, she lives in New York, she lives on the Upper West Side, but half of her, you know, friends have, you know, parents who are gay or, you know, in, divorced or in, in some relationship that would have been scandalous uh, not too long ago. And clearly that's the wave of the future, that um, social liberalism is, um, is on the rise and it's, it's, uh, it's a big problem for Republicans now. It's a wedge issue for um, liberals and progressives in a way that just recently, until uh, a decade ago, it had been the other way around. At the same time, um, we've had an explosion of economic inequality in this country where I could just spend the rest of the afternoon shocking you with figures. Um, the, uh, I'm sure you've all heard that wages for, wor uh, for workers have been flat since the mid-1970s. Um, whereas the amount of wealth uh, owned by the, one per the top 1% has increased by 500% in that period. The, the most horrid figure to show you that um, how little progress we've made <coughs> is that since uh, the recovery began, it may be ending last Friday, but since it began in um, January of 2009, uh, the top 1% has enjoyed 93% of all economic gains since 2009. So clearly this problem is not one that's been solved, it's getting much, much worse. And it's worse in this country than anywhere else. It's a global problem, but we have chosen to make it worse with the legislation that Congress has passed, uh, cap reducing taxes on capital gains as opposed to um, payroll taxes is one ex enormous example. Uh, there are others. So. Uh, liberalism is in uh, sort of on life support as an economic philosophy, which is originally was born at, but it's doing very well as a cultural matter. If you look at um, Andrew Cuomo, who is uh, outside of the outside of Hillary Clinton and Joe Biden, the leading contender to be Democratic presidential nomination, he's uh, very popular with the Wall Street Journal and National Review. And Chris Christie says they disagree on next to nothing, and they agree on 96 percent. Of things, he killed the millionaires' tax. He's killing uh, the budget for New York City schools. He he killed this tiny little program. I read a column in the New York Times about that that helps um, orphaned children find homes. Like it's just nobody would even notice it. It only cost eight hundred thousand dollars a year. Um, and yet, he's, in terms of social legislation, he's probably the leading progressive uh, voice in the country. This is what liberalism has become. It's become a force that has, uh, that has given up, really, uh, the fight against the power of big money, which is the New Deal part of, the, of liberalism. And it has embraced almost entirely the 60s side of liberalism, which is expanding personal freedom for women, um, for minorities, uh, in, in uh, family life and cultural life. Now, I, I'm for all those things. Um, I'm not against any of them, but I, I, I worry, you know, I, I wouldn't choose, I think liberals have, have um, taken their eye off the ball. And there's a good reason for that. The reason for that is that our elections are largely determined by the power of money. Since uh, Buckley v. Vallejo, where the Supreme Court decided that 
not only is um, money speech, but corporations are people, um, the power of money to determine what uh, members of Congress do uh, is almost absolute. And th at the end of the day, when everything's already been decided, they run for office and have frequently different rhetorical positions and some differences on the issues. But the narrowness of those differences is, um, is determined by the power of money. Uh, the example I always use that drives me the most crazy, crazy of late is that the, um, the chairman of, the, of Barney Frank's um, House Banking Committee, who was in charge of writing the legislation for the consumer finance, whatever, uh, he, he quit his job and went to work for Goldman Sachs before the legislation was even completed. And there was no shame attached to this. The bank, the power of money is so, is so accepted and so intense on Capitol Hill that, I mean, Barney was mad. But Barney hired this guy. Barney picked a guy who would be a guy who would likely to do that because that's who the people are that are available. So the power of money, um, and it's liberals, liberal money is no different in this respect. Liberal money, it, it pays for gay marriage legislation and it pays for um, other forms of social progress, but it doesn't want uh, necessarily to pay uh, to end inequality. It doesn't, you know, it wouldn't mind paying some higher taxes, but it's not interested in, in, in um, certainly not in any restrictions in free trade, certainly not in protecting the right of unions. And, um, and as we lose the institutions that liberalism has traditionally been based on, liberal churches, unions, the media, all of these institutions are under attack um, and in decline. Uh, it's hard to see how this can be reversed, uh, except, you know, conceivably it could get so bad that moral outrage would arise and it would, it would and people couldn't hold their heads up in their communities unless they uh, took more progressive positions with regard to the poor. But, but, the Supreme Court is now making it possible for people to fund these these organizations anonymously. You don't have to reveal the sources of your, of your money since Citizens United and now they're, that's for individual, for, for outside groups. They're about to overturn the um, limits on funding candidates themselves. So, so it's, um, we need to, before any of these uh, problems can be attacked, before we can fix the environment, before we, you know, address global warming, before we can uh, address the sources of inequality, before we can uh, make healthcare more effective in this country uh, so that 20, 25 percent of it doesn't go to the healthcare companies just for pushing paper and, and uh, you know, you pay $17,000 when you get a headache um, and go to the emergency room. Uh, we need to address the power of money in our society because it's, it's like a barrier that's destroying not only liberalism but democracy. So I'll stop there, and I hope we can have a discussion. Thanks for listening so patiently. Capitalism in the Muslim country and in inequality of money. Society is a very complicated organism, and you can't overthrow it and expect the, the uh, result to be um, a peaceful. And the new left was um, impatient with the trying to understand the causes of the problems that it sought to address. And it, it eventually, um, when it failed to succeed, um, it collapsed into a spiral of um, violence and um, terrorism. It organized people for outrage. And uh, that outrage in, was in many respects um, justified. But it had the effect of uh, of inspiring outrage on the other side and violence on the other side. And so um, if you take, uh, I don't know what example you want to take, the one I spend a lot of time on the book in is uh, the takeover of Colombia, where um, because the, the uh, SDS uh, didn't like the degree of access that the community was being given to a gymnasium that was being built in a new um, building in Harlem. They took over the president's building, the president's office, uh, 
they uh, destroyed research on the part of professors that was never replaced, could never be replaced. Was, careers were ended. Uh, you know, they, they did all kinds of um, uncivilized things in the office that I won't go into any detail. And they made all kinds of demands which were, were non-negotiable. They were not intended to be uh, negotiated. They were intended to be entirely symbolic. In other words, irresponsible. Now, the, the, there's a quote at the beginning of one of my chapters, the one on this incident, where I quote the leader of the Columbia SDS, whose name was Mark Rudd. And, and the quote is, the issue is not the issue. So clearly, the fight in the minds of all those students, they didn't really care that much about the gymnasium. They cared about the war in Vietnam. They cared about racism. They cared about economic injustice. Um, but they didn't, ha they didn't know how to address those problems. And so the reaction was a, was a uh, symbolic and uh, ultimately juvenile and self-defeating one, which made everything worse, in my view. The thing, liberalism for better or worse, and politically it's for worse, but in reality, it, in, for, for purposes of peace, it's for better, is a process. It's a way of doing things that, um, that, that, takes, that goes step by step and is um, by definition reformist. It doesn't, it's not good at inspiring people's passions. Conservatives are much better at inspiring people's passions than liberals. But the value of it is that it doesn't, it doesn't throw babies out with bathwaters. You would never have a liberal tea party because you would see that you know, every problem would be its own problem and you would try and find a solution within the context of that problem. The new left was a lot like the Tea Party in that it, it was kind of, um, it was, I mean, I actually think it was inspired by much more genuine problems than the Tea Party is, but it, it was kind of a, 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 a fit. And um, I'm all for, you know, I marched uh, in the demonstration against the uh, Iraq war, the very first one, the week it began out, I wanted to register, I wanted the world to know that, um, that New Yorkers and people opposed that. But I didn't expect that march to end the war. I didn't expect that march to convince the people who were prosecuting the war that I was right and they were wrong. I was just registering my dissent. That's the beginning of the process. The New Left treated that as the end of the process and had no plan for in the middle and ultimately devolved into, into violence and, um, and uh, Stalinism. So uh, I, don't wanna, I don't wanna attack the motives of the people who are in the new left, but I think it's ultimate effects. I would have been much happier if things had continued on the reformist path that they were on in the early 1960s than in the revolutionary path they took in the late 1960s. The changes that happened in Iceland in 2008 were very interesting to me, and I don't see it uh, published in the news very much. You know, they redid their government, their yeah. financial system, a lot of really nice things. I'd love it if some of those things would happen here, and I'd see that as would be like pretty miraculous if, if any of those things came to be. But what kind of things that they've done are possible here, and, um, and why is this story so suppressed? It's really funny, right? I wouldn't say it's suppressed. I mean, we don't get a lot of Icelandic news of any kind, <laughs> good or bad, in our media. I actually had a graduate student who was from Iceland. And she wrote a paper on this, which is the only reason I have any idea what you're talking about. Um, but to answer your question in a larger sense, uh, I was just saying earlier today to a class I was teaching, um, one of the, I, I pride myself on my, uh, uh, my, the ability of my cynicism to keep up with reality. But it, it didn't do it. It couldn't do it in 2008, 2009. I thought that the banks and the financial industry had been so discredited um, by the, the, the damage that they had done and their dishonesty had been so um, shocking to people that they would be forced, as uh, big business was forced in 1932, to accept some real strictures on their behavior, especially since we now owned them you know, as taxpayers. We were saving their next um, with our investments. And yet, that wasn't the case at all. They went into Congress and made the same demands they always did. And Congress, after making some speeches and calling them names in public hearings, by and large gave them everything they wanted. 
so that today those banks are on average 20 to 25 percent larger than they were when they were too big to fail. And we have the phenomenon of HSBC, which is my bank, being too big to follow the law. I mean, if you follow that story, HSBC was found to be guilty of, of money laundering for drug dealers and terrorists. And the government decided not to prosecute, not because they didn't think they had a good case, but because they didn't want to disrupt the financial system and cost the jobs that the destruction of HSBC would have caused had those people been held responsible for their actions. So you can be too big and too powerful and too rich to be even asked to follow the law in this country. That is a reflection of the power of money and the way we've allowed our political system to be taken over by it. What do you think it would take for the majority of American voters to realize that their interests are not being served by supporting a Congress that continually uh, votes in favor of that 1% uh, and the inequality of wealth that it represents. What would it take? Well, even if the voters thought it wouldn't matter right away, I mean, they, they, they probably think that now. I mean, congressional approval ratings are below 15% overall. For the Supreme Court to change its view, uh, you'd need an amendment to the Constitution or you'd need a new Supreme Court. Um, and those, those things are uh, long-term processes at best. I mean, the problem with fixing this money problem is that it's viewed by most people as a process issue. It's not a real issue. I mean, it's, it's a real issue in every single one of these issues, but there's a, it's an extra step. So to get people excited about the process is very difficult, particularly since money in politics, you can't really get rid of money in politics, money in politics has always been there and whatever you do, whatever system you come up with is going to have flaws and so it's necessarily going to be very complicated and of course the media have no interest in fixing the problem because the media are the ones making all the money from the television commercials which is what drives the whole thing, the most expensive aspect of campaigning is buying television time. There was a Fa McCain-Feingold law passed in 2002 that attempted to address campaign finance it had three components. The third component was the forcing the media, forcing television stations to charge the, their lowest rates to political campaigns. That was the only part that was defeated because the, those guys knew where they had to do their campaigning and they didn't want to piss off the media. So it's a multifaceted problem and it's not really one that is subject to um, democratic pressure at the moment. However, um, there was an election in upstate New York uh, in this past cycle. Uh, there was a woman whose name is very difficult to pronounce. Um, it's kind of a Polish name. Uh, she was way behind a Tea Party candidate. She was getting no help at all from Governor Cuomo. Uh, with a month ago, she said, what the hell, I'm going to lose. Let's make my campaign about campaign finance and nothing else. This is a campaign for democracy. Um, a whole bunch of good government groups joined her. They went door to door in her little district and she won ultimately after a Florida style fight over balloting by 13 votes. Um, and now she's a warrior for democracy. So what that says is that if your neighbors and the people you know have the time to come speak to you about this issue, um, it can be won. Because believe me, this little town in upstate New York, this little district, was not a fire with campaign finance before this began. And like I said, she came from way behind to win this. But it involves a level of in personal engagement by people who are trusted, by your neighbors and your friends and your church members and so forth. That is very, very hard to do in a country of 300 million people. But I think that's the only model. Because w otherwise people just tune it out. They don't, they don't believe what they hear. It's just politicians lying and so forth. One reason that Republicans until recently have been so good at getting people to vote against their economic interest is that people don't believe people, the politicians, when they say they're going to help you. So if you don't believe that the government's going to help you, you might as well vote for the guy who hates the same people you do, or who goes to the same church you do, or is the same color as you, whatever, because it doesn't really matter what they say they're going to do. So you need, you need people who are, who are engaged and known to you and members of your community to be your spokespeople. And that, that was what the Obama people were really good at, identifying, that was their genius in 2012. I was surprised, I was shocked at how, I really couldn't understand how Obama was governing in terms of running. 
Like I, in other words, I thought he was making a lot of really bad decisions for someone who wanted to get reelected. What I didn't understand was how, how closely he had his finger on the pulse from this incredible operation he had that was um, talking to people all the time, neighbor to neighbor and so forth, and they were all pretty happy with him. And he was able to use that incredible network to stay very close to the, un to the understanding of the grassroots at the same time he was able to keep the elites pretty happy. He's a brilliant politician in that respect, um, which is the respect that you get reelected in. So in a short answer to your question, or a the end of a long answer to your question, it's got to be a person-to-person -person type organization. And, and that's very hard to build, but there's no alternative. It's not just the power of money. It's uh, very much also if the justice system is infected by this uh, disease in this country. Wh where is democracy? What, what is do you, left? What do, you, what, do you, what do you think can be done about that? That people vote their own prejudices? As justice. Well, uh, they're supposed to be justice. No, but what, what Impartial, impartiality is important, don't you my think? My daughter is supposed to treat me respectfully. <laughs> what, what, what is it that can be done about that? What do you, what do you imagine can be done with that? It's a scandal. <laughs> do you see any greater hope for a more uh, progressive second Obama term based on the way he sounded both in his second inaugural and his, in, in, in his recent State of the Union. Slightly more assertive and forthright and less uh, bemused by the possibility of working with the Republicans and slightly more faithful to some of the uh, principles that, that liberals believe in. Or is it just more of the same? No, I agree with everything you just said. I would put a period on it at the end of, uh, instead of a question mark, because you kept saying the word slightly or a bit. I mean, he, it did take him an awful long time to be disabused of his notion that Republicans could be brought around to cooperate with him. Um, but I think he finally has been disabused of it. He still wants people to see him as the kind of guy who would be willing to go the extra mile for that cooperation, so he's not going to um, go as far as I would like. He's still beholden to the same interests that he was beholden to, but he recognizes that, um, that uh, the recovery hasn't done much for working people, and those are the basis of the constituency. He's aware of inequality exploding. Um, he would like to do something about that, although it's not uh, a priority. But he knows that, you see, people become more uh, liberal during conservative presidencies and more conservative during liberal presidencies. It's because people just get dissatisfied with the way things are. So Obama knows that uh, for him to be seen as a success, uh, number one, he needs a democratic successor. And number two, he needs the economy to be seen as moving forward. I mean, he, you know, Obama was elected with a higher unemployment rate than anyone since Franklin Roosevelt in 1936. A lot of people thought it was impossible. Um, so uh, that what that means, and it's something I think most people, close political observers, always understood, was that it doesn't matter where unemployment is when a president comes over, it matters if it's going up or if it's going down. Because most people are employed, you know, even if employment's at 15%, it's still 85%. People have jobs, and the question is, are they afraid of losing their jobs or not? So Obama really needs people to feel like things are getting better. And he, people were very patient with him. They gave him four years, they let him give all that money to the banks. Nobody liked that. Um, but now I think he understands for him to be seen as a success, he needs, to, uh, he needs to have that change hit real people, which is why he was much harsher on Republicans with regard to the sequester than he's been really with regard to anything. His rhetoric has been very clear. Blame them. They're in my way. They're preventing me from doing what I want to do for the country. So I think, yeah, slightly, I'd say, you know, 20 to 30 percent. It's not the difference between, I, I wrote a book called Kabuki Democracy, which came out in 2010. It was called The System Versus Barack Obama, and I was very sympathetic to the difficulties Obama had in uh, making things stick in those days. And I, made the, and I made the point that Roosevelt didn't really become aggressive until his second term, and maybe we had hopes for that. Uh, that was a little, a little overboard. But I do think his second term would be better than his first term. Uh, you said the Tea Party organized people for outrage. I sort of link it together, or, or not link it together, but connect it to the um, telecommunication bill and the fact that it, our media is owned by corporations. I once heard you say regarding Obama and the health care system that it was best 
anything that he could achieve, the ACA, under the present climate, but it is the media that creates the climate and also didn't counter the Tea Party's ability to create outrage. And was I too oblique? No, but it doesn't require any further comment from me. I, I basically agree. I mean, the Tea Party and, and the media, the Tea Party and big business are now in conflict. Big business did not want to sequester, and the Tea Party caused the sequester. Um, and, and the Tea Party is sort of this monster, this Frankenstein monster that was <coughs> created in part by uh, right wing funders like the Koch brothers and, um, and by the media fascination with them. And now they only represent 8% of the country, according to public opinion polls. And yet they're in the driver's seat of the Republican Party, which is in the driver's seat of the House of Representatives, which prevents anything from happening. So it's a very bad situation. I do think it's kind of a separate problem from the fact that our media are not doing a good job. I've written books about that too, but that's another talk. So um, if you were Pope of Unitarian Universalists, uh, and you could galvanize this whole community across the United States. And you, uh, what would you suggest as a single issue that people could um, focus on? Um, well, I, I think it's a funny idea. I think I'd rather be the rabbi. Um, th there would be two issues. W one would definitely be. Um, money, the power of money. So of all the different groups that, they probably got a lot of groups meeting here at night, you know, to, to do good works for different things. They all should have a component that's about why money is so important in that issue. And why, if you care about this issue, you've got to care about money. You've got environmentalists coming here, you've got nuclear disarmament coming here, you've got to look at, at you have women's <coughs> equality coming here, you've got to look at where the money's coming from and how that presents a barrier to democracy being realized. Uh, secondly, our, our media are dying. Our, good, our, our reliable media are dying. We never, it's don't it always go to show you don't know what you got till it's gone. I wrote many books complaining about the media, but now I miss it because, um, because powerful people get away with a lot more as a result of the media not being there. And, um, and a lot more terrible fa uh, people, as Tom Stoppard wrote in uh, a great play of his, you know, uh, people do terrible things to each other in the dark. Um, and, and the world is a lot darker, and it's getting darker every day. Uh, so I would also, um, something's got to replace that. And, uh, and people need to organize themselves to inform themselves. So I would, I would create new media, and I would focus on the evils of money. I think the, the Christ, Christian religion had a, had a fellow once who talked about the evils of money. And, uh, very eloquently. He, he was a Jew. Give it. He was a Jew. Right? <laughs> but, <laughs> but there's some history to this. <laughs> Since uh, we agree that people need to band together. And money is power. My question to you is why do you give your money to HSBC instead of a credit union? Is it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, I. Um, uh, because I, I, am, I am imperfect in many ways. <laughs> You're just scratching the surface. <laughs> First of all, thank you very much for all your doing and do keep it up. I have one short comment and then I have a question. Um, we all understand and are glad that the um, movement for gay rights is, is proceeding. At the same time, we need to remind ourselves that abortion rights are also being um, uh, or uh, um, well, there are something like 27 states now who have uh, encroaching on a, the uh, abortions. I just wanted to uh, yeah. say that. My question is, though, <clears throat> would the evaporation of the Occupy Wall Street be an example of the sort of inefficacy of the new left that you were talking about? I think Occupy Wall Street was incredibly effective, shockingly so in terms of making people aware of the economic facts of inequality. But then you come up against what is to be done, and um, an organization like that couldn't possibly come up with that answer. It's up to those of us who are engaged in, in the policy-oriented world. Now, Occupy Wall Street was on the one hand wonderful, and on the one hand 
on the other hand, ridiculous. They, they never could come up with a demand. And if they had come up with a demand, who would care? They, they didn't have the power to demand anything. So they were a protest movement, and protest movements are really good at, co at bringing attention to problems, and they were wonderful for that. It's the rest of us who should be picking up the ball at that point and coming up with plans to rein in the power of the banks, to, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, so I guess I would be critical of people who thought, you know, Occupy Wall Street was more than a protest movement. Um, as a protest movement, it was pretty good. Uh, you know, there have been wonderful protest movements in this country. I'm not against protest movements in this country, but I, I, I think protest movements ought to know what they're good for. And also, the other problem is that most Americans don't go to protest, don't go to protests. In fact, they would never go to protests, and they're afraid of people who do. So it's real important if what you're trying to do is to convince people to speak to them in a language that they can understand rather than one that repels them. When I was an undergraduate, I did an awful lot of research, uh, public opinion research on the uh, anti-war movement. And of course, originally it was quite effective um, with Gene McCarthy's campaign and so forth. But by the end of it, actually more people supported the war because of the anti-war movement and didn't. Because they didn't want to be associated with those crazy people who were saying all these terrible things about their country and couldn't take a bath or anything like that. They were, it was Richard Nixon's best friend. Nixon loved the anti-war demonstrations because they brought more people to his side. So Occupy Wall Street, given you know, that they, were sort of, they had those drum circles and they went like that, they, they, they were pretty savvy about public opinion and they did a really good job. And I think that um, uh, it, it requires an awful lot of creativity to figure out where to go once you've um, identified that issue, and they, I don't really blame them for not being able to solve it because I, I don't know how to solve it. Either. Network media and the power of the broadcast and the, uh, uh, the potential for campaign finance reform. Well, there's two problems. One is newspapers and one is broadcast. Uh, broadcast media, the news comes from newspapers and magazines. There's very little news in broadcast media. There's some in NPR. 60 minutes a little bit. There used to be documentaries like Edward R. Murrow and Bill Morris used to be on CBS, but for a long time there's been no news. What it did do, though, is create a, a narrative that people shared. So it kind of, it's very important in sort of letting people know they all live in the same country. And they, and these are the problems that other people face who you might not have thought about, even though it didn't, it didn't um, uncover any actual news all the news they got, they read in the New York Times and the Washington Post and the Wall Street Journal, um, and Time and Newsweek and the New Yorker, et cetera. Um, so the disappearance of that, so the fact that 70% of people used to watch the evening news um, in the 1960s, and now um, uh, it's, it's the audience is down to about 14 million people combined, and all those people are 65 and older, you can tell from the commercials that they, it's like a booming hemorrhoid problem in this country. Um, so what that means is that people think of themselves less and less as Americans and more and more of the particular community that they feel closest to. Uh, that has good aspects and bad aspects, um, but that's the fact. It's like the internet. Um, with regard to the loss of traditional uh, print publications and their not only the loss, but their diminution. The New York Times, which is the healthiest of all of them, is still at about, um, has about 40% fewer reporters than it did five years ago. The Washington Post and the Los Angeles Times have fewer than half, and the Wall Street Journal is owned by Rupert Murdoch. Um, and he's probably gonna buy the Los Angeles Times, too. Um, so that means that uh, we just have less information, number one. Uh, you know, they can, they can be corrupt in ways that people will never find out. They can pollute. They can, you know, take advantage of us. They can make deals that we'll never know about. But number two, they also don't have to worry so much about what these um, previously civic, these previously understood to be civic-minded voices cared about. Because those voices are, are much smaller and they can, they can take those hits. So something can be on the front. You know, I'll never forget this. I read on the front page of the New York Times before we went into Iraq that all 14 
U.S. intelligence agencies had concluded that there was no terrorism <coughs> deriving from Iraq, but there would be if we invaded Iraq. Now, I thought that's a pretty good reason not to invade. If it was just a war against terrorism and the people you pay to find stuff out tell you that they're not supporting terrorism, but if we invade, though, we will inspire a lot of terrorism, maybe we shouldn't do it. Front page of the New York Times. You know, it, people talked about it for a day and then it disappeared. So, and the New York Times was more important back then than it is today. That was 10 years ago, by the way. We're in the 10th anniversary of the decision. So, so the fact is, is that um, you can say almost anything about someone now and, and it'll go away in a day. Um, and, uh, and so I think that's, I mean, like I said, there were an awful lot of problems with the way the news business operated until now, but losing it is, 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 is a much worse problem than we had before. So. Uh, we need, to, we, need to, we need to address that. That was really great. I appreciate that answer, but I, I didn't express my question right. I was really wondering about the money that comes to fund, it, to fund our, uh, the electoral system, our, pol our political system that comes from traditional broadcast, if the traditional broadcasts are diminishing because of the fragmenting media landscape. Do you understand what I no, mean? No, the, the, the money that funds our electoral system comes from traditional broadcast. I'm what does that mean? Through the, through the broadcast, the traditional broadcast media, the, the ABC, NBC, CBS, they're diminishing in power, and that's, you're saying that that's, where, that's the no, source of funding for our campaign. They're still buying commercials. These people are still getting rich in battleground states. Yeah, yes and no. I mean, the, the, the internet is controlled similarly by similarly large corporations. They're, they have a few small voices. I mean, the New York Times and the Washington Post are very small voices. They're tiny little companies. They're, they're not connected to these large conglomerates. But the internet is similarly dominated by large conglomerates like Yahoo and Google. Um, and uh, and they, they, will, they will take over. Their power uh, will be the power that politicians have to respect as opposed to NBC and CBS and Disney. It's, it's, Functionally, it's not going to make much difference. It's just, you know, the names will change, but the, the facts won't, as I see it. it. It's bad to predict the future, but I, I don't see a lot of hope in that area. Sorry. Try to end on something hopeful. Remember that lady in upstate New York? Really? That was cool. Huh? All right. <laughs> okay. Joe, do you want a question? <clears throat> He was talking about something hopeful. Yeah. Uh, I, I wanted to wonder out loud if you can imagine preparing the public for a, for a ceremonious withdrawal of our consent from our government, preparing our, our society for that with a, uh, say, a revolution by discussion where we do articulate the alternative. Along those lines, this is the baseball cap. Let's replace our corrupt government in front. Uncle Sam is a big bully and bribery rules Washington. So in other words, whereas we have a terminally corrupt government, it is appropriate that we replace it. And do you explore the idea of achieving the articulation that's actually happening, the alternative? No. I got wrong with Thank you very much. Thank you.